What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the Big Dogs Got E Fantasy Football Channel. As always, it's your boy Nick. If you're new, welcome. I want to say this really quickly before we start the video. If you purchased my draft guide, first of all, thank you. Second of all, I sent out the newly updated rankings two nights ago, Tuesday night. So if you didn't get them, first check your spam folder. If you didn't get an email, it's not in either the inbox or the spam. Shoot me over an email, which I'll list right here. Let me know and I'll send it right over to you. If you have not yet purchased the draft guide, I promise you it is worth the $4.99 that you'll spend on it. It's top 250 overall ranking position rankings by tier which are updated every single week throughout the preseason up until the regular season that's some shit you will not get anywhere else i promise you that top sleeper list top bus list top 45 dynasty rookie rankings key offensive additions to every single nfl team and then my big dogs gotta eat bible aka the draft day manifesto it's like four thousand words of how exactly you should attack this year's fantasy football draft position by position broken down if you're interested in buying the guide, I'll link it here as well as all the videos linked in the description. Follow me on social media, but let's get into the video. We're doing top five running back sleepers, getting drafted at pick 120 or later. So these are deeper guys, guys that can make or break your team, guys that could potentially blow up, right? They could be your league changer, your league winner. Yesterday, we did the wide receiver list. We did top six wide receiver sleepers. So if you missed that, go check it out right here. Today, we're going to do the running backs, though. We got a good episode for you. So I've already taken up enough of your time. So let's get right into it. First of all, the list is in order of ADP, lowest to highest. So it's not exactly in order of like my preference or how much I value them. It's just the top five list from ADP. First up, we got my boy Thomas Rolls. Rolls Royce out in Seattle. Now, if you follow my channel at all over the last two years, you know that I just hate Eddie Lacy. I think he's just a, you know, he's probably a nice person, but he's, he's just overweight, man. And every time you hear these rumors about him being overweight, it leaves him with an injury. What, you think it's a coincidence that he keeps having ankle injuries every time he's overweight? No, it's not fluky kind of shit. You heard all the rumors this offseason about him overweight. They literally put a contract in place to make sure he hits weight goals throughout the offseason. Now he has, but I'm still not sold on Lacey being anywhere near as good as he ever was in his career. And I'm fully expecting Thomas Rawls to take over this backfield, which he has up to this point. They signed Lacey to a fat contract, pun very much intended. But Rawls was working with the first team, and then as reports came out from camp, he actually... He completely overtook the starting role there and was getting all the first team reps. It's easy to say, hey, they're just giving him a chance and practice, whatever. But then the preseason games rolled around and we saw Rawls dominate the first team reps. Eddie Lacy didn't even step on the field until Trayvon Boykin stepped on the field, who is their backup quarterback behind Russell Wilson. When you look at Rawls, right? 5'10", 215 to 220. Really good size for running back. Is a bruiser, but he also has above average elusiveness, if not very good elusiveness. Looking back at 2015, rookie season, he led the NFL in yards per carry with 5.6. A lot of people were very high on him entering last year and he did enter the season as a starter, but, but he came to another leg injury, had to miss seven games last year, just didn't look that good. But as an overall sample size, dating from his rookie year up until the end of last year, we do have some, some things to go off of. So dating back to 2015, in games where Rawls has received at least 10 carries, which is a sample size of 12 games, he's averaged 100 in total yards, 0.5 touchdowns, and over 14 fantasy points a game in half point PPR. So that's really good numbers. But obviously the question comes down to, you know, can he stay healthy? Because when he's healthy, he's a very, very good running back. It's scary because, you know, after, after breaking his ankle in 2015, he's now, reports are coming out that he's dealing with a very, very minor ankle injury. Pete Carroll's backed that up saying it's, it is very minor, but he is missing these games now. Probably won't suit up for this upcoming game. So it's something to really, really monitor, but you're getting him at pick 120. And I actually don't hate the injury because if it is as minor as they say it is, his ADP is probably going to be even pushed back farther. And now you have CJ Procise who strained his groin or whatever. But Eddie Lacy's ADP will probably go up. Rawls's and Procise's will come down. And I like the latter two much more than I like Lacy. Lacy, I'm not even touching unless there's a season ending injury to Rawls or something like very serious where he misses big time. So Rawls, I still love. I don't think the ankle injury is serious. The injury concern is definitely there, but you're not risking a fourth or fifth round pick like you were last year on him. Eddie Lacy's still going to play a role, of course, but way more of a change of pace. CJ Procise will have a sizable role. He'll be the pass catcher there, but shown in that sample size. You know, Rawls will produce as long as he's given the touches. And if you're the starting running back in Seattle, you're going to get 10 touches a game easily. They do like to use a workhorse if possible. If someone emerges, like we saw Rawls in 2015, they have no problem feeding him 20 to 25 carries a game. I'm not leaning on the side that that actually happens, but the upside is easily there. So Rawls needs to be drafted in every fantasy league, and he should open the season as a starter as long as he is healthy. So we move on to running back number two. It's Ja Quiz Rogers. Two Zs. 
135th pick overall, running back 47. So we know Doug Martin suspended for the first three games. Quiz is expected to, you know, lead the backfield in carry. He's just expected to take over pretty much as the featured back in Tampa Bay while Martin serves his suspension. Now, I wasn't really sure how the workload was going to kind of be split up throughout the preseason because there's rumors that it's going to be a backfield by committee. But you look at the preseason games and what we've seen is Rodgers is easily the first team back when Martin's out and he's going to get as much work as he can handle. And according to ESPN Bucks reporter Jenna Lane, Jacquez Rodgers stands a chance at unseating suspended running back Doug Martin for the starting job. And the head coach actually came out and said he can't, you know, confirm that Doug Martin has a starting job when he comes back. But like, given the talent level between the two guys, Martin versus Jacquez and their, and their potential and just their raw skills, it would be nearly impossible for Jacquez to outright steal that job from him. But you're still gonna get a huge workload from Rodgers in those first three weeks. And you look at those first three weeks, the defenses that they're playing against. He gets Miami week one. They were the worst defense in the NFL against the rush. 4.8 yards per carry. Get Chicago, 23rd ranked rush defense. And then you get Minnesota, 16th ranked last year. So all three teams are bottom half of the league in terms of run defense. So Rodgers should open up with a really easy schedule, should come out really strong. And then you look at Martin's kind of off, off field behavior, the suspension, coupled with plenty of injuries throughout his career. There's a good chance that we see Rodgers back in the lineup again as their RB1 one way or another after the first three weeks of the season. So, you know, while you think you might only get him for three weeks, there's a good possibility you might have an RB1 or two for maybe four or five weeks. It's a small sample size, but, you know, last year in games that Jaquiz handled more than seven carries, which was five games. He averaged 105 total yards in those games, two receptions per game, and .4 touchdowns. So those are probably numbers that you can kind of expect to see over the first three games. The Bucks have a really solid defense, and you know, you saw on hard knocks, the coach is saying to Jameis Winston, we don't need you to win us the games, right? We know you can, but we're gonna rely a lot more on the defense, a lot more on the ground game, not as much on the passing game. And last year, when you look back at how they finished, right? Winston's pass attempts, over the first half of the season, games one through eight were over 38 pass attempts per game. Then they kind of switched their philosophy. Over the second half of the season, the last eight games, they were averaging just over 31 pass attempts per game. So 38 down to 31. In that second half of the season, they finished six and two. So it was a winning formula for them. Stick to the defense, stick to the ground game, uptick in carries for Jaquiz Rogers. In the week two preseason game, we saw Doug Martin actually get the start and he looked pretty good. He rushed seven times for 30 yards, I think it was, scored a touchdown. Caught two of his three targets for another 11 yards. So he looks spring, he looks spry, he looked ready to go. The muscle hamster will be back in action week four. But Rodgers was right there getting those first team reps. So again, I don't think the question mark is whether or not he's going to be the guy there for the first three weeks. It's kind of what happens after that. What you're doing with Rodgers is you're basically renting a high-end RB2, low-end RB1 for first three weeks of the season for a 13th, 14th round pick. And for me, I'm definitely willing to make that exchange. And like I said, there, I, I definitely think there's a possibility that he gets back in the lineup as an RB1 throughout the year because Doug Martin has proven that he can't really stay healthy for 16 games. Numero three, the three spot. We got my boy Darren Sproles out in Philly. Don't skip ahead. I know he's old. He's boring to talk about. Going 143rd overall off the board, running back 49, which is insane in PPR leagues. This is just a simple case of tried and true. Now, I usually personally don't like to to take PPR type running backs, you know, guys that catch a lot of balls but don't get a lot of the run game on their team. Guys that are very roller coaster-ish, you know, on a week-to-week -week performance basis. But Darren Sproles is going 30, 40, 50 picks after a lot of guys that are probably going to put up exactly the same production, if not worse than him. And you have Duke Johnson going 50 picks before him, CJ Procise 30 picks, James White 25 picks before him. Him and James White had almost identical uh, production last year. James White had 700 yards, five touchdowns. Sproles had 800 yards, four touchdowns. Very similar to these other guys who were going much, much earlier than him. Now you look over the last six years, right? Sproles hasn't had a single campaign under 705 yards, four touchdowns, and 40 receptions. So those are not like eye-popping numbers, but if you're in a deeper league, a lot of you guys are probably in 12, 14, 16 team leagues. Those are great numbers for PPR plays that you can get after pick 140. I don't see him slowing down and I see the production has been there year over year, right? Look at his PPR finishes. These are over the last six seasons. Starting with 2016, RB24, RB28, RB24, RB23, RB13, RB5. Now those stronger years are obviously his years with the Saints, but even over his last four years, right? 24, 28, 24, 23. You're getting a low-end RB2 basically every season in, in PPR leagues. While these type of guys are hit or miss on volume on a game-to-game -game basis, the numbers don't lie that at the end of the year, he's going to finish in that top spot. And that can be said a lot for guys like Theo Riddick, James White, blah, blah, blah. 
But Sproles has done it for so many consecutive years, right? These other guys come in and out. The Charles Sims, oh, RB17, three, two years ago. Didn't do it again last year. So you see the same thing with a lot of these guys. They can't do it consistently when Sproles has been one of the only players in the NFL that can do this. While inconsistent, he does it on a consistent basis, if that makes sense. His yards per carry and his yards per receptions both increased from 2015 to 2016. Tells me he's not really in any danger of slowing down, even though he is old. One of the best parts about him is that he's only missed six games over the last nine seasons. So at a position that's really fragile, right? You have this guy, Darren Sproles, who is not going to miss games for you. Look at last season. He racked up 865 total yards. He caught 52 balls and scored four times. That was in 15 games. Those 52 catches ranked ninth among all running backs in the NFL. And again, 15 games. Had he played that 16th game and caught just, I think it was two or three balls, he would have been top five in that category among running backs. So you're looking at a real, real dynamite PPR play in Sproles. I know it seems like a crowded backfield, right? And maybe that's why you're down on Sproles, or maybe it's just because he's not exciting. But look at rookie Danelle Pumphrey. He's done nothing that's impressed this offseason. There's always going to be hype around every rookie running back, but he hasn't done anything. Played in the first two preseason weeks, saw eight targets, only turned that into 32 receiving yards. So he's getting the opportunity, not getting the yards that he should get on that opportunity. And Jimmy Kemsky from Philly's Voice expects Pumphrey to start the year on the team's inactive list if he even makes the team. So, you know, you see him in the role that Darren Sproles would have played. They're not playing Darren Sproles at all in the preseason, obviously. Why, why play a veteran like that? But you're seeing the amount of targets that Sproles should be seeing, you know. Pumphrey saw six targets in that first game, and obviously he's not playing a full slate of snaps. So that's the kind of opportunity you're going to see from Sproles. And then next, you got to look at sophomore back Wendell Smallwood. He's received some praise as of late. Um, a lot of the coaching staff has really liked him, but he just returned back to practice from like a, a hamstring issue. He was mediocre in his rookie season at best. So just 82 touches, and I don't really think there's going to be a big increase in touches there. Nothing really shouts that out to me. And I'm not really going to get into Blunt because they play two completely different roles. Blunt's the runner, obviously. Sproles is not. So I see a big, big workload still intact for Darren Sproles. And he's come out and said, you know, the offense is built to get him the ball in space way more often this season. That's just our thing now. More so than even last year. We're trying to get mismatches. And the Eagles running back saw combined to 115 targets in 2016, and they were the sixth heaviest passing offense in the NFL last year. So 115 targets for the running back position, even if another guy in the backfield gets 35, 40 catches, Sproles has plenty, plenty, plenty left of targets and opportunity to give you great value where you're getting him. So I'm looking for Sproles to lead the team in snaps and, and just benefit from their style of play. So we keep moving down the list to my boy out in Buffalo. Obviously not the Sean McCoy, you schmucks. I'm talking about Jonathan Williams, 160th overall, running back 54. Saw it with Mike Gillisley last year. We saw it with Carlos Williams two years ago. No matter how good and how much production the Sean McCoy gets, because he will get his production, the Bills' number two running back will always, 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 always have a fantasy role. Second year back at Arkansas, Jonathan Williams, nearly an identical build to the last two second string running backs the Bills have had, right? Six foot, 225, so big bruiser, good by the goal line. Safe to say the Bills have, have a type. Williams has looked really good this preseason. They're not playing Shady really at all, just very minor snap count for Shady this preseason. Jonathan Williams exploded in the first game. He only got four carries, but turned it into 39 rushing yards. He caught his only target for seven yards, so he's showing some versatility. He also had a really, really nice, smooth 17-yard game that got called back, so it would have been an even bigger game. Either way, it was a really good showing for Williams, and now he's going to be running behind one of the top uh, run blocking lines in the NFL. Last year we saw they were, I think they were number one overall in yards before contact on the running back per carry. So like the yards before running back even gets contacted by a defender per carry. So they get a lot of push, which is good for a big back like Jonathan Williams because they get push and you got a bruise like that coming at you, you're not tackling his ass. The other thing with Jonathan Williams is he's one of the very few running backs in fantasy football that has standalone value as well as he's a true handcuff. So listen to this. These are three quick need to know stats from the 2016 season. Michelle McCoy had 13 rushing touchdowns. The Bills had 29 as a team. Buffalo trailed only Dallas in rushing attempts per game. So they run a ton. And even if McCoy gets 13 rushing touchdowns, they had 16 other rushing touchdowns to divvy up among the other runners, Tyrod Taylor. So there's plenty of opportunity to score there. Now, I wouldn't peg LaShawn McCoy as, you know, particularly old at 29 or really injury prone, but he's only played the full 16 games in three out of his eight NFL seasons. He's got a ton of tread on the tires. So it's very likely, you know, apart from the games where Williams will give you touchdowns, because he will do that probably six to eight times this year, there's a 50-50 chance that McCoy misses one, two, three, even more games than that, right? So for someone you're getting 15, 16, 17th round, Jonathan Williams, I'm targeting him in a lot of my drafts this year, even if I don't own LaShawn McCoy. If you do own LaShawn McCoy, definitely 
definitely, definitely, definitely get Jonathan Williams. And I own him in probably 80% of my best ball leagues because, like I said, he sc he'll score a lot of touchdowns, and that's super valuable in those. So the last and final running back on the list, DeAndre Washington out in Oakland. 177 overall, running back 59. Realistically, it it's possible, it's very possible that Washington finishes with around the same, maybe a small improvement on his stat line of last year. He rushed 87 times, 467 yards, 5.4 yards per carry, very good. Scored twice and added an extra 115 receiving yards on 17 catches. So the difference this year, of course, is that you have Marshawn Lynch in the backfield ahead of DeAndre Washington instead of Latavius Murray. Now, I think Lynch is a much better running back than Latavius Murray was, as I thought Washington was way better than Murray was too. But the question marks in terms of longevity and the chances of a backup running back coming in and having to play a bigger part, maybe due to injury or whatever, is much higher with Lynch than it was with Murray. Lynch is 31 years old, nearly two years away from the NFL. And the last time we saw him, he wasn't running particularly well, right? Like 3.8 yards per carry, he played with injury. So there's definitely question marks there. And Washington will be the first guy up if something happens to him. He's been running with the second team offense basically all summer. Started the first preseason game when Lynch was out. Still rotated with Jalen Rashard. Jalen Rashard is definitely still going to be playing a role there. DeAndre Washington, for me, is a clear handcuff here, and I think he'll serve as a fine PPR, a deep PPR play as a pass catching back there, too, because that was never Lynch's strong point either. But Washington overall is a good running back, right? He ranked fifth in the NFL last year in breakaway run percentage. 8.1% of his carries went 15 yards or longer, and that was fifth in the NFL among running backs. He was 10th in yards after contact per touch and second overall in yards per carry against stacked fronts. He averaged 6.3 yards per carry against eight guys in the box or more. You know, he was a favorite of mine coming out of college. Actually, one of my bold predictions last year that he was going to be a top 12 or top 15 PPR back. Never got the chance with Murray. I still think he could have done it if he, if they did the right thing and sat Murray. But Washington, he's a baller, man. 84th percentile in the spark score. I think he'll earn some more touches this year. If something were to happen, he becomes an immediate high-end RB2 because he still will share some of the work with Richard, but he will be an instant plug into your lineup play if if Lynch gets hurt. So remember, he's running behind one of the best run blocking lines in the league. And that's a wrap. And I want to leave you all with a question I forgot to do in yesterday's wide receiver video. Out of these five running backs, if you could own them and the guy in front of them on their team, on your fantasy team, which duo would you choose? So for Thomas Rawls, it'd be Rawls and Eddie Lacy, Quiz and Doug Martin, and so on and so on, et cetera, et cetera. Sproles, Blunt, Williams, McCoy, Washington, Marshawn Lynn. If you could pick one duo out of those five, which two do you want on your fantasy team? Comment down below. If you enjoyed the video, please go give the video a thumbs up to scroll down a little bit. Scroll it, scroll it, scroll it. Hit the little button that looks like that. I appreciate the shit out of you. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe because we're going to be hitting videos like this all throughout summer, all into the season, all that kind of stuff. Follow me on Twitter. I got all my personal social media down there. Again, if you're interested in the guide, also link down there. I'll see you all next time. Peace.